Pay close attention. What you're about to see is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you news as it relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Israel Hawkins. Well, today's broadcast, we're going to be talking about protests in China over lockdown. You know that China has been having some very strict protocols with their COVID-19 lockdowns, and the people, I believe, are getting pretty tired of it. Um, we're going to also look at Putin, who says he's going to step up its military campaign. And we're going to talk also about North Korea as they continue with their missile test. But first, in regards to China, those protests are continuing to rise uh, at an Apple factory, which is actually Apple's largest iPhone factory in China, which is called Foxconn, where protesters there clash with police over frustrations that they have to share dorms with infected co-workers. Now, those problems are in addition to their dissatisfaction over pay. 200,000 people are employed at the factory. Now, clashes took place outside as protesters threw barricades at police and bashed surveillance cameras. Mm -hmm. Now, workers are upset uh, of a delay in unpaid bonuses and the strict COVID-19 lockdown protocols after a sharp rise in cases in China. Now, daily cases hit record highs since the pandemic began. Mm -hmm. Well, the plan has been the plant, excuse me, has been in lockdown for four weeks, allowing factory workers to both work and live on site to prevent the spread of the virus. Now, some are even saying that they have been forced to share dorm rooms with those who've contracted COVID-19. Well, Foxconn said those rumors are not true and released a statement saying, quote, they are trying to fix an input error in the computer system and working to actively solve the concerns. End quote. But because of the protests, Apple is expecting delays in their iPhones for the holiday season. Well, a news report from August 22nd of this year presented information that showed that deaths in vaccinated people outnumbered the unvaccinated. A chart also showed uh, weekly deaths displayed uh, that in February that people who were vaccinated suffered more deaths than their unvaccinated counterparts. Well, Dr. Weber of UNC School of Medicine said most of the deaths that occur are typically in older people. Now, he said that older people were typically the ones who got vaccinations because of the compromises in their immune systems. Now, and as a result, the number of deaths in older people were higher. Right. Uh, Dr. Weber also said that you have to adjust for age and ask the question, is it vaccinated versus unvaccinated? Uh, what age group and did you have two, three or four doses? And of course, keep in mind that uh, that most of these deaths are really considered COVID related, not caused actually by the COVID vaccine, right. COVID-19 itself. Well, take a look at this video we have for you displaying the ongoing crisis in Haiti, the large groups of Haitians immigrating to other countries and, of course, their unsavory treatment. Haiti's second largest city, Cap Haitian, lies on the northern coast. Some of the Haitians who were deported from the U.S. were flown here. We've arranged to meet one of them. Jacques is 26 years old. He used to live in Port-au-Prince but he's now in hiding outside of the city. He's afraid to return home because he says a local gang accused him of ratting them out to the police. From there, he traveled overland to the U.S.-Mexico border, where he intended to seek asylum. Jacques arrived in Del Rio, Texas in September 2021, along with almost 15,000 Haitians. The situation posed a major dilemma for the Biden administration, both logistically and politically. Hey, you use your women? This is why your country because you use your women for this. Thousands returned to Mexico to avoid deportation. Others were moved to detention facilities in the U.S. 2,000 were swiftly flown back to Haiti, 
Jacques was one of them. The atmosphere awaiting him resembled a war zone. More than 1,000 people have been killed in the violence just this year. The security situation in the country has deteriorated significantly in the past year. Recently, Haitians are taken to the streets protesting high gas prices and a government that they have little confidence in. Starting in September 2021, the US conducted more than 200 flights, expelling more than 25,000 Haitians. In protest, Dan Foote resigned his position as the Biden administration's special envoy for Haiti, calling the deportations inhumane and counterproductive. And there is a process, we're just not using it. By not giving us the claimers of asylum due process, we're breaking international law and convention. The Associated Press reported that out of 84 nationalities requesting asylum over a recent three-year period, Haitians were dead last in their acceptance rate. You have to wonder, going back to what President Trump mentioned, we want people from Norway who have blue eyes, uh, blonde hair, but we do not want people from countries like Haiti and many African countries. So what I really understood is that Trump said it, Biden proved it. The United States also deports people who are legal residents but have been convicted of a crime. Some of them are in prison again, this time in Haiti, and can't get out. These are extremely difficult questions that involve people's lives and people's well-being. And that is something that the State Department and the broader uh, U.S. government is doing everything that we can to address. As the situation in Haiti continues to worsen, the White House considered the possibility of sending Haitians captured at sea to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Immigrant rights groups protested the idea in a letter to President Biden, writing... Your administration should not add yet another chapter to the shameful U.S. history of mistreatment and racism toward Haitian people seeking protection. Yeah, well, that's sad, you know, because it's it's not just Haitians, but uh, they in particular have had a very tough time, uh, even going back to the uh, the earthquake that they suffered suffered not that long ago, and it took a long period of time for them to get them get help. They're very impoverished and they're trying to find a better way of life for themselves. But it seems like in every door they knock on, it's being closed in their face. So that's got to be very frustrating. Right. And Haiti is just uh, one of many countries right now that have a lot of internal clashes and mm -hmm. fighting taking place. That's right. Well, Black Friday, as it's known today, is an American tradition that brings holiday shoppers out in droves to buy discounted items uh, the day after, of course, Thanksgiving. But this year, protests are planned by workers of one of the world's most famous dot-com stores. The organizers of the walkout are calling it Make Amazon Pay. Well, thousands of Amazon warehouse workers are planning to walk out of their jobs on Black Friday to take part in a multinational protest against the online giant. What do they want? Well, higher wages, safer working conditions, and the right to form or join unions. Now, this isn't the first time workers have done this, but actually the third year that they have rallied together for a better standard. Now, a company spokesperson uh, uh, said they, they did actually acknowledge to Fortune magazine that Amazon is working to address some of the issues that, of course, the workers are having. Hmm, interesting. Well, President Putin is promising to increase the amount of military equipment Russia produces as the invasion of Ukraine continues. President Vladimir Putin uh, said, quote, there is no need to introduce any extraordinary measures, but it is necessary to establish clear, high quality and well coordinated work, end quote. Uh, he is determined to continue to provide for his military or his army quickly, making sure it continues to be well equipped. Well, has a new war begun between Turkey and Syria and Iraq? Well, this next video will give you the details on airstrikes Turkey is calling Operation Claw Sword. Please take a look.
var. Sağ ol. Sizler sağ olun. Bizim maksadımız hepinizin bildiği gibi, hepimiz hep birlikte aynı amaca yürüdüğümüz gibi 85 milyon vatandaşımızın ve ülkemizin güvenliğini sağlamak ve ülkemize yönelen e, her türlü hain saldırının da mutlaka karşılığını vermek. Yeah, you know, it, it's sad because in that area you, we have Syria who's been involved with many uh, conflicts and they've had also a lot of displacement of their civilians as a result of continuous airstrikes, even those that included the United States and Russia when they were in that area fighting right. as well. One of many countries that once the war starts, the inhabitants there are displaced. That's right. Well, this next video is about a war also, a war over water the water of the Euphrates River, to be exact. But as one country controls the waterway, it is drying up down the line. Pay close attention to this next video. Iraq is oil rich, but the country is plagued by poverty after decades of war, droughts, and desertification. Adding more to the disaster is the fact that the river, which is said to have watered the biblical Garden of Eden, is found to be slowly drying up. Drought in the Euphrates River has been a phenomenon with a lot of religious backing. However, when the Bible says particular things will happen, it doesn't tell if it's due to nature or because of man's politics or industry. They happen. One of Western Asia's most essential and longest rivers is the Euphrates. It originates in Turkey and travels through the southeast mountains and southern foothills of the area before flowing into Syria and Iraq, and a variety of vegetation before emptying into the Persian Gulf. Even though centuries of human occupancy and activity have drastically degraded the terrain, some remnants of the old vegetation in the Euphrates Basin remain. Images taken along the Euphrates banks show that a sizable portion of the river has dried up. Pictures of Syria's second largest dam on the Euphrates River reveal that the river's flows have substantially fallen. The waters flowing into Iraq and Syria are mostly shut off by the Turkish state, exploiting the Euphrates as a weapon against Syrians for years. Syria is meant to get 500 cubic meters of water per second from Turkey, according to the 1987 agreement between the governments of Damascus and Ankara. The occupying state, however, does not uphold the deal and is currently only supplying 200 cubic meters of water each second. On the land, the detrimental impacts of the receding waters are evident. For example, the water levels in Syria's dam lakes have declined due to the water restrictions, and so have the region's electrical supply and production. Along the river, rice and wheat fields have turned into baked dirt. Canals have dwindled to shallow streams, and fishing boats sit on dry land. Pumps meant to feed water treatment plants dangle pointlessly over brown puddles. On top of that, the Euphrates River's banks are losing agricultural land. Most critically, it's become harder to access drinking water. The consequences for one's health are grave. According to the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, the Euphrates River water reduction policy of the Turkish government will put 9 million Syrians living near the river at risk of humanitarian catastrophes. The international community and human rights organizations are implored by the Dams Administration of North and East Syria to put an end to the aggressive acts of the Turkish state. The poor suffer more acutely, but all strata of society are feeling the effects, including sheikhs, diplomats, and even members of parliament who retreat to their farms after weeks in Baghdad. In Iraq, there is a severe drought. The rain-fed north's wheat and barley plantings are down by about 95% from average, and the east's citrus and date palm groves are dry. The reservoirs have been drying for the past two years due to much below average rainfall. The American officials expect that this year's wheat and barley production will be a little over half of what it was two years ago. It is a problem that jeopardizes the foundation of Iraq's identity, including its past as the world's largest exporter of dates, the source of barley for German beer, and the nation that takes patriotic pleasure in its pricey Anbar rice. Iraq is more than just an area between two rivers. Now, grain imports into Iraq are increasing. 
Farmers along the Euphrates River lament that they might have to switch from anbar rice to less expensive types. Although officials claim they have become more frequent in recent years, droughts are not uncommon in Iraq. However, the Euphrates and its larger, healthier sibling, the Tigris, are being choked by more than just drought. The Turkish and Syrian governments are the most commonly mentioned offenders. Iraq is a country downstream, but has access to an abundance of water. According to Iraqi water officials, there are at least seven dams on the Euphrates in Turkey and Syria. Since no treaties or agreements exist, the Iraqi government is left to beg its neighbors for water. In the end, we would like to conclude that the shrinking of the Euphrates, a river so crucial to the birth of civilization that the Book of Revelation prophesized its drying up as a sign of the end times, has caused a lot of alarms to go red. Global communities must align together to find a promising solution to this problem. Katan, we see how the, the river, of course, is affecting so much mm -hmm. there in the country. The agriculture, we're yeah. already experiencing famine in many different parts mm -hmm. of the world. Now they're saying the crops are going to be cut in half. Um, uh, some of the, uh, the staples that they need mm -hmm. to grow mm -hmm. to survive aren't going to be there in the numbers that they were hoping. So, you know, all these things will eventually catch up right. in the food chain. So uh, we're definitely going to see the results here in the months and the year to come mm -hmm. uh, regarding that food shortage with the River Euphrates drying up. That's right. Well, the U.S. has deployed supersonic bombers and fighter jets in response to North Korea's recent missile testing. Now, South Korea has shown the U.S. conducting drills with them as a sign that they will not tolerate North Korea's aggressive behavior. So far this year, North Korea has tested cruise missiles, hypersonic and submarine launch ballistic missiles. At the end of this week, it was an ICBM. The country's leader, Kim Jong-un, has one clearly staged goal. He wants to be able to deliver a nuclear weapon. Well, even though the South has protection from the United States, the people are now expressing their desire to have their own nuclear weapons. Now, a logistic company operator, Helen Shin, told TRT World News, quote, we are geopolitically and diplomatically sandwiched between great powers. If we had nuclear weapons, we would have more power to negotiate independent from these superpowers, end quote. Well, some analysts have proposed South Korea be a host to U.S. tactical nuclear weapons with a shorter range. Uh, quote, there is a fundamental fear of nuclear weapons, end quote, quote says uh, Cha Du Hoang uh, from the Asian Institute. He continues, quote, because we cannot control this fear, North Korea must also have a fear of counterattacks from South Korea or the United States. But for that, uh, for the South to deploy such a weapon, it would not be a small task. Dr. Cheng from the Xiong Institute believes the U.S. would agree with them having their own nukes. Now, he told TRT World, quote, If South Korea possesses nuclear weapons, the threshold for weapons for North Korea's use of nuclear weapons will rise, reducing the possibility of nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula. Interesting. At Katan, it's an interesting thought that uh, countries feel, hey, if our neighbors have nuclear weapons, if we get them, well, then they won't want to use theirs because now we have them and we can use them against them. Yeah, that'd be kind of like uh, two neighbors on a city street, uh, putting one putting a cannon on their front porch, you know, mm -hmm. because the other has a handgun in his house in order to deter it. But we know that over a period of time, the other nation only finds a way to either get bigger or faster weapons to counteract the potential attack from what they call their enemies. It's a tit for tat, back and forth. The weapons start off small, they get big. But as we know with nuclear, you don't get bigger than that. That's right. And two wrongs don't make a right. Well, if you'd like to learn more about these stories, contact the House Yahweh when you do. Don't forget to request your free copy of the monthly newsletter and Prophetic Word magazine. Here's how. To contact the House of Yahweh, you can write them at the House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas 79604. You can call them at 1-800-613-9494. Visit us on any of our websites by going to Yahweh.com YisraelHawkins.com or Yahweh'sBranch.com. You can also visit our website by going to YPNNews.com. 
You can email the House of Yahweh at info at Yahweh.com. For all calls outside the United States, please dial the number on your screen. And don't forget the Israel Says and Ask Israel programs available online 24-7. You can find those by just typing in YisraelSays.com and AskYisrael.com. Well, don't go anywhere. Up next is another classic message from Yisrael Hawkins. From all of us here at YPN News, I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. And I'm Katan Alexander. Thanks for watching.